Thanks, Jenny. Welcome everyone to our endowed lecture for the Child and Adolescent Psychiatry Division. Uh, this lecture series is made possible by a generous gift of Dr. Volney Gay in honor of his wife, Barbara, who's here with us. Welcome Barbara and um, Volney to today's lecture. Barbara served Metro Nashville Public Schools as a school psychologist for over 20 years before retiring in 2008. And her commitment to the community and to the well being of children um, is really what um, inspires the work that we do here. I am absolutely thrilled to have the opportunity to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Ellen Liebenluft is chief of the section on mood dysregulation and neuroscience and co-chief of the Emotion and Development Branch at the National Institute of Mental Health, where she spent the bulk of her career conducting research on bipolar disorder. Uh, Dr. Liebenluf was instrumental in advocating for a narrow definition of bipolar disorder in youth and has contributed to seminal longitudinal studies of youth with severe irritability, discovering that these symptoms are predictive of depressive disorders and anxiety disorders in adulthood, but typically do not reflect early emergence of bipolar disorder. Her group defined the syndrome of severe mood dysregulation, which ultimately led to the inclusion of disruptive mood dysregulation disorder in the DSM-5. I was a resident in the early 2000s when there was really huge controversy in the field about what do we call these children who have severe both chronic and episodic um, irritability. And Dr. Liebenloof's work has really um, insisted on having a foundational science that guides our treatment decisions. She's also contributed greatly to our understanding of brain mechanisms of psychopathology through her work using functional MRI, along with standardized behavioral paradigms and careful characterization of clinical symptoms. I'm looking forward to hearing more about that work today. Dr. Liebenlift is the recipient of many awards, including the American Psychiatric Association Blanche F. Idelson Award for Research in Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, the Litchfield Lecture at Oxford University, the Michael Rudder Lecture of the Royal College of Psychiatrists, and the Julius Axelrod Mentorship Award from the American College of Neuropsychopharmacology. She is an incredibly generous mentor um, who really has um, contributed in so many ways to supporting the careers of um, scientists with whom she's worked. She's authored over 300 publications and is a highly sought after speaker, giving keynote addresses at many of the most preeminent conferences and institutions internationally. It's truly an honor to host you virtually today. So without further delay, I'll hand off to Dr. Liebenluf, who will present today's Barbara Gay Lecture. So um, I wanna thank everybody um, very much. Um, it's really great to be here. I only wish you could be in person. Um, and um, I want to especially thank um, Meg for the really generous intro introduction and also um, that Barbara Gay is here um, is very exciting. And today I am indeed going to talk about childhood irritability. And um, in particular, I'm going to focus on frustration and how we understand how the brain processes frustration. Um, I don't have any conflicts. Um, all my research is funded by the NIMH uh, intramural program. I will say that I will talk about off-level use of methylphenidate and citalopram. Um, very brief outline. I'll give an introduction, a sort of overarching introduction to irritability. I'll talk pretty briefly about treatment, but we can, of course, go wherever you want in terms of the questions. Um, and I'm going to focus most of my talk on neural mechanisms of frustration. Um, uh, Meg mentioned that um, the, that my work in many ways started with the bipolar disorder controversy about whether children with chronic severe irritability should be considered to have a form of pediatric bipolar disorder. I'll show you data um, about that. 
And um, since that time, um, the you can see there has been a growth in irritability studies, if you will. Here you see an increase in the number of NIMH grants on irritability. And here's a um, number of publications. And I always say that it's a good field for um, young researchers because there's still many fundamental, important, yet tractable questions um, to answer. Um, there's also many more presentations at national and international meetings than we have been having an annual or biannual irritability conference since 2015. And um, anyone who's interested in knowing more about it, please just contact me. So here's some overarching um, findings um, that have been replicated. I'm gonna focus here, this is sort of a background of kind of things to know to get yourself oriented to the uh, research on pediatric irritability. There uh, are many different ways to define it. Our working definition is increased proneness to anger relative to peers. Um, it is very common, the child psychiatrists in the audience know this, it's one of the main reasons that children are brought in for care. It's transdiagnostic, fits extremely well within an RDOC um, system, and it's impairing even, and by independently impairing, I mean, even if you account for impairment from anxiety or ADHD, which are the two most common comorbidities or ASD, um, the irritability itself still adds more impairment. Um, I'm going to talk some about how um, you can think of, although we're not sure if this is quite right, but um, I'll, I'll talk about that. But we tend to clinically, at least, you can differentiate these developmentally inappropriate temper outbursts, which are the main reason that children with irritability are typically brought in for care. In the way that we've defined it, we also um, study children who at the same time they have these outbursts, they also have chronically angry mood. And those are the phasic versus tonic aspects of irritability. I'll be talking more about that later. I'll show you data that as Meg said, uh, chronic severe irritability does not predict bipolar disorder, but instead predicts anxiety, unipolar depression and suicidality. And that prediction to depression and anxiety has a genetic component to it. Indeed, when we think about heritability, um, irritability, here you can see the heritability of irritability, and it's moderate. It's, it's analogous, in fact, to the her heritability of anxiety and unipolar depression. What happens to children with chronic severe irritability as they grow up? And during the time of the bipolar disorder controversy, a really important question here was, as children with chronic severe irritability grow up, are they at increased risk to develop classic bipolar disorder, bipolar disorder with distinct episodes of mania and depression? And this is a meta-analysis um, done by uh, Vidal Ribas in Argir Stringaris's lab, and you can see the end there. Um, and what you see here, this line is an odds ratio of one. So if the diamond is to the right, that means that severe irritability in childhood is associated with that diagnosis um, later on in life, in late adolescence, early adulthood. And you can see that you see that association with depression and anxiety with ODD, but that's a bit tautological but not with bipolar disorder. And so youth with chronic severe irritability do not, grow, do not have increased risk to develop bipolar disorder when they grow up. And therefore that's what sort of tipped the scales to saying that that presentation, that phenotype of chronic severe irritability shouldn't receive the diagnosis. Those children should not receive the diagnosis of bipolar disorder. That led to the um, creation of DMDD, Disruptive Mood Dysregulation Disorder in DSM-5. And um, as I uh, have said to people, including this morning on a good day, I'm 60% pro the diagnosis. So I see that it has a lot wrong with it. And we can also get into that. But just um, so you know what we're talking about with this, this is a synopsis of the criteria the severe recurrent temper outbursts that are inconsistent with the um, context, the situation or developmental level, 
and they occur more than at least uh, greater than or equal to three times a week. That is somewhat that is arbitrary, and that's one of the problems, the main problems with DMDD. We need much more research on normative thresholds for um, temper outbursts, and in fact, that work is going on. Um, also, DMDD requires mood between outbursts, that the mood between outbursts be anger or irritable most of the day, nearly every day, observable by others. I'll talk about that in a moment. Present for more than 12 months, so it has to be chronic, and present in at least two settings, the settings being home, school, and peers. Now, there are two, three really common pitfalls that I want to highlight in diagnosing DMDD. Excuse me, the first is that many people think that in order to receive the uh, diagnosis of DMDD, um, the child has to exhibit physical aggression. That is not true. And here I have the um, actual text from the DSM and note that it includes verbal rages. And that's much more common in these youth than is physical aggression. Also, this criteria about the mood between outbursts being persistent um, most of the day, nearly every day observable by others, you may recognize that it's the same as the criteria for MDD, but it turns out that uh, unfortunately this criterion for both MDD and um, DMDD has poor reliability. So that's another way in which this could be um, cleaned up. So how do you, and so when, though if you wanna be um, assessing it, how do you do that? Think about how you assess MDD and how you figure out if the child's um, persistently irritable or sad most of the day, nearly every day. Um, and here, the kinds of questions we ask for the irritability is, is the child generally grumpy or cranky? Do you have to walk on eggshells? Oops, sorry. The um, other thing which is tricky is accommodations. Um, as those of you who see um, children know, um, if a child is, in, is um, engaging in uh, or has these outbursts, the parents naturally are going to try to accommodate and they may often give in to the child's demands. Of course, that's the kind of thing that's um, that we work with a lot in parent training. But so you can have a child who um, is not very irritable, but they are not being um, asked to do things that they don't wanna do. So that's also something you really wanna assess very carefully is what kind of accommodations um, are going on in the home and in school. Okay, so let's talk briefly about treatment. Um, some basic things, as I said, it's very impairing and very common. So there's a real uh, public health need for treatment of, um, for more research on the treatment of DMDD. Psychotherapy is a very important part of the treatment and often neglected um, by psychiatrists in particular uh, in favor of medication. But there are a number of studies, um, not a lot in school age children, certainly in preschoolers, there's a large literature on parent training um, for temper outbursts in preschoolers. Um, in school age children, there's a much smaller literature, but there are a number of, these are basically CBT based um, treatments. And this one by Melissa Brotman is um, still experimental, but it's a very interesting um, uh, approach where she uses exposure to frustration along with parent management training. Um, there are only two published medication uh, RCTs for uh, DMDD or its precursor severe mood dysregulation. Um, Dan, uh, Dan Dickstein's paper was with lithium and it didn't work it well at all. We stopped it early. Um, Ken Tobin's paper, I'm gonna show you. Um, and of course, there's a larger literature on the treatment of irritability in the context of autism, along with an FDA indication for um, atypical antipsychotics. Um, it's been suggested in the literature that this lack of evidence-based treatments may contribute to the very high prevalence um, in our country of antipsychotic use in youth. And in fact, in this um, Olson et al. paper, um, they found that the main indication for antipsychotic use in young children was ADHD. 
And one can't help but wonder, in fact, later in Corel talk in this, um, in their editorial about it, that um, the reason for the high antipsychotic use in youth with the diagnosis of ADHD is the irritability. So if we had more treatments for irritability, also I think if um, psychotherapeutic approaches were used more, we might have less medication. Although it is certainly true that many of these youth are so impaired that they do require medication. Um, if the, the first rule of thumb is if there's a co-occurring diagnosis, so irritability rarely occurs alone. So if the child is depressed and irritable, you would treat the depression. If the child has um, separation anxiety and irritable, you would treat the separation anxiety. And um, now let me talk a little bit about ADHD because as I said, um, children with ADHD are probably, I mean, it varies um, with the data set, but probably somewhere around 40%, 30 to 40% of youth with ADHD have moderate to significant um, irritability. So this is a post hoc analysis. This is again, something that came out of our Gearsis work. Uh, it's a post hoc analysis of the MTA, the large MTA, uh, the NIMA, um, uh, study on the treatment of ADHD. And um, you can see the ends there. And um, what you can see, so this, um, this is just sorting out the irritability per se. Um, and so the treatment uh, conditions here are clinical care, uh, behavioral treatment, medication management, and combined medication management and behavioral uh, treatment. And you can see that the two treatments, which include medication, the combined and the um, medication management alone, do the best. So um, compared to the others, but importantly, what this shows is that in children with ADHD, irritability does respond to, it was in this instance, methylphenidate treatment. Um, now, would stimulant treatment help in children, with, in, in children with irritability without ADHD? We don't know. Uh, there's no data on that. It's an important question. This is kind of the reverse um, question, which is, okay, these irritable children, how well does their ADHD respond to the treatment? And it's exactly um, what you, um, you see that the high irritability and the low irritability youth, it, their ADHD responds exactly the same. And once again, of course, it's the behavioral, uh, I'm sorry, it's the medication and the combination. Those are the two conditions. And then they work as well for ADHD treatment in the high irritable children as they do in the low irritable children. And furthermore, that it also decreases the irritability in the high irritability children. So um, we went ahead and did a uh, trial of um, SRIs in irritability. And so you may ask why. Uh, first of all, there's the co-occurrence of irritability with anxiety and depression that we've talked about, those longitudinal and genetic associations with anxiety and depression. Some evidence in adults for the efficacy of SRIs and anger attacks, as well as in irritability in the context of premenstrual dysphoric disorder. Um, obviously, the SRIs have a more benign side effect profile than the atypical antipsychotics. And so what we did and what I'll show you here is an RCT of methylphenidate plus citalopram, because these children all had DMDD as well as ADHD. So it's methylphenidate plus citalopram versus methylphenidate plus placebo. And here you see uh, the design. It started, we took them off all their medications. It was done in an inpatient setting. Um, there was open methylphenidate uh, treatment for everyone. And then that open, we, there was a dose finding phase. And then um, everyone continued on open methylphenidate and um, was randomized to either placebo or citalopram. And it was an eight week trial. And what you see here, I want you to focus first here. This is the open methylphenidate. 
these dots here. And notice that this is the irritability severity. Notice it goes down. So we're seeing in these kids with ADHD, their irritability on average um, decreasing with uh, methylphenidate alone. At this point of randomization, they had to still be a certain high level of irritability to be randomized. And notice that 11 of them um, out of 60, I forget exactly, it's 23 plus 23 plus 11, 11 of them were um, no longer eligible after the methylphenidate. And that left us with 23 and 26. And you can see here, you see it both here in terms of irritability severity and here in terms of proportion of treatment responders that indeed there was a separation between those who got the citalopram in addition to the methylphenidate versus those who got placebo plus methylphenidate. Now it's a small study, so we can only view this as a pilot. Um, there uh, were not um, overall global improvement, although they, and this often happens in these clinical trials, so they improved in irritability, but their overall impairment did not diminish. Um, so, you know, I wouldn't say that this is super strong data, but it's suggestive. Okay, let's um, turn to the brain. Um, so why do we care about frustration and irritability? How do we think about them together? So temper outbursts, and again, you know this clinically, typically manifest in the context of frustrative non-reward. And frustrative non-reward is a um, construct that was defined by Amsel. And he said that an organism undergoes instrumental learning and learns to expect a reward. Um, here, the rodent, when it presses the lever um, and the light is on, expects to receive a food reward. And if the food reward isn't delivered, Amsel said, then the emotional state of the uh, rodent is frustration. There's been blocked goal attainment and frustration. And frustration is associated with increased motor activity and aggression. So we, in a, um, in a um, review article uh, first authored by Melissa in 2017, we suggested that in youth with irritability, there are neural and behavioral alterations, which of course is what we spend all our time studying, such that when there's blocked goal attainment, the child experiences um, non-normatively increased anger and frustration and motor activity and aggression. And this is what we view, what the world views as the temper outburst. So you can see how frustration, frustrative non-reward is very central to um, irritability in particular to the temper outbursts um, of children with irritability. We, um, so we do a lot of frustrating kids in the scanner and we use three different frustration tasks. Um, I'm gonna talk and, and what you'll notice is they all differ in terms of what uh, the cognitive process is, how we induce frustration and um, how the frustration and non-frustration blocks relate to each other. I'm gonna talk in a lot of detail about the affective Posner, walk you through it, and a little bit about the change task here. The carnival task is designed to test whether youth with irritability have deficits in reinforcement learning, either at baseline or after frustration, and also to study prediction error um, in that context. So the, the AP, Affective Posner Frustration Paradigm, it in, induces frustration with a relatively large effect size and it does so reliably. And here's the task. And here we've mapped it onto Amsel down here. It's a Posner task for those of you who know it. They see a cue and then a target and they're supposed to press the button on the side of the target. And first there's instrumental learning. So at each trial, they get money every time they get it correct. And it's very easy. They get it correct like 95% of the time. So they build up a bunch of money. Then uh, we induce frustration with blocked goal attainment and specifically now we rig it. So when they're correct, um, they get positive feedback 40% of the time, but 60% of the time we tell them it's too slow. 
and they lose all the money that they had um, acquired, you will be happy to know that we give it to them, of course, um, uh, afterwards, and we tell them about how they were deceived, uh, et cetera. We debrief them. I'm gonna just show you some data from this, which is the part of the task after the child has just received negative feedback, uh, frustrating feedback versus positive feedback. So the contrast here is the child's just received frustrating feedback and now has to do the task again. And here's, it's 195 youth, you see the age, it's trans diagnostic. And we looked for associations with irritabilities as a dimension. So it wasn't done diagnostically, it was done trans diagnostically, uh, irritability, also anxiety. And again, this is after they've been frustrated and now they have to do the next trial. And what you see is that the more frustrated, the, I'm sorry, the more irritable the child is um, over the past uh, week, the more they engage um, these regions in the PFC when they're trying to do the task again. And you can see there's um, both um, ACC as well as some um, uh, more dorsolateral uh, regions, both medial and lateral regions. And there are similar findings in the striatum. Now, remember, these are children out here who are irritable, but they are well regulated enough to stay still in the scanner and to not quit the frustrating task. So of course, one hypothesis is that they have to engage um, a lot of PFC, particularly robustly in order to be able to do this. I will just show you there is a developmental effect here. This uh, effect I was showing you with higher irritability and higher associated with higher engagement is particularly true in the younger children. And by the time you get to adolescence, it's no longer significant. Now, this is, I wanna get into some new and unpublished work. Um, so what this uh, had us thinking about was how our ability to evoke frustration in the scanner would allow us to study uh, frustration as a very dynamic brain-wide circuit level response. Um, and so it pushed us, of course, towards connectivity. And what we started doing, and I'm gonna show you two pilot studies here, they have the same design, but they use two different frustration tasks, the AP we just talked about and the change. And the frustration task is flanked by pre and post resting state. And we used graph theory metrics, which I'll explain to you um, to analyze the data. And this would allow us, as I say, to get brain wide circuit level um, measures. And the two questions we were asking was, how does the composition of brain networks change during and after frustration, number one? And then the really clinically important question to us, do individual differences in this network response to frustration predict irritability? And this, of course, is to clinicians, the really important question. So this is a very brief selective intro to graph theory. So um, the brain is made up of uh, networks and networks or um, made up of modules. Modules are made up of nodes. These nodes are brain regions. And the nodes are connected by edges, and the edges here is functional connectivity. So it's the extent to which two nodes, they're the extent to which the um, activity in two nodes during this uh, functional task, the extent to which that activity is correlated. And that's, the, um, that's what the edge is. And I'll show you that also a little bit later. So how does the composition of the brain networks change? So we think of networks in the brain as like the canonical networks, the default mode, the ventral attention network. And that is true. Those do exist and they're particularly prominent in the resting state. But as the brain engages in a task or responds to an emotional stimulus, the um, nodes within those modules, within those networks, they can change their affiliation 
And uh, that's part of the brain adapting to the task it has to do or the environmental stimulus it has to respond to. And here again, you see a cartoon of this. So these, this, this uh, cartoon on the left has the same number of nodes as this on the right. But notice that here they're organized into three modules. And here they're organized into just two modules. The edges have changed and we now have uh, just two modules. And so the clustering scheme amongst the nodes and precisely the composition of the modules has changed. And we can quantify that by a variable called the VIN. And I'll be showing you some data to answer this, how the composition of brain networks change during and after frustration. I'll be showing you VIN data. Then our clinically important question, well, the other actually is clinically important, but our more obviously clinically important question about do individual differences in the network response to frustration predict irritability? And again, you can see this intuitively here in this cartoon. This is a low efficiency node. Uh, I'm sorry, a low efficiency module. This is a high efficiency module. And you see that the difference is the, um, the edges. And so there we looked at the um, metric of efficiency within the modules. And the reason we do that and to see if that's, uh, if, if global efficiency in modules predicts irritability. And I'll be showing you this data in a lot of detail. The global efficiency is thought to index the capacity to exchange information within a module. It's been associated with cognitive processing and adaptation to emotional stimuli. And we used a prediction framework with a held out sample to see whether we could predict irritability by global efficiency in any of the modules um, in the brain. Okay, the methods. Um, N is small, it's a pilot study. I'll show you we're um, organizing a much larger study. Again, transdiagnostic. And this is what it looks like. Here, the non-frustration was done outside the scanner. Then they immediately went into the scanner, nine minutes of resting state. And they did the affective Posner task. And you're just seeing two trials of it here with the feedback here. So same task, post-task resting state. And then we looked across six experimental conditions. And um, I'm only going to be focusing on the pre-resting state and the post-resting state, because that's where the findings are. Um, in fact, we tested across all six conditions in all brain modules and then controlled with permutation testing. And as you'll see, what's really interesting was all in the post-test resting state. You can think of this as recovery after frustration, okay? This is our baseline, if you will, and this is recovery after frustration. Okay, um, we used fMRI prep, 116 parcellations, um, 100 cortical, 16 subcortical, um, built these matrices, which are the functional connectivity between each of the nodes um, and thresholded it. And there, um, it was per uh, condition. So there were six, six of these, uh, these matrices for each subject. And again, it's the pre and post resting state that we'll really be focusing on. And then we applied our graph theory metrics. Yulia Linka, who is, um, if you will, a graduating postdoc, she's actually currently um, on the job market, um, and Katerina Kurchansky, who's my staff scientist, are the two brilliant um, women who um, really are the ones who did all the work here. And I can't say enough about their skill and their talent, and they're also really wonderful people. So number one, how does the composition of brain networks change during and after frustration? Here's pre-resting state, here's post-resting state. These are different modules, a visual one, you can think of it as a, a network, uh, parietal, frontoparietal. This is an anterior default mode temporal limbic network. I know that's a huge uh, mouthful, but I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna be talking to you a lot about this pink network. The size of the bar, the height of the bar shows how big 
that network was, how many nodes it had um, in pre-resting state and post-resting state. This is the VIN. And remember, that's a metric of how much reorganization each of these networks has gone through as you go from the pre to the post-resting state. And notice that the biggest VIN is the pink network, these pink dots here. And you can see this goes from being very big to much smaller. And I'm gonna show you exactly how that happens. The other, the second most uh, changeable network is this frontoparietal network. And those of you who study um, the frontoparietal network, that won't surprise you. I'm not gonna talk more about that, but we can later. Okay, so here we are again, these bars are the same. These are glass brains and what you're doing is seeing the nodes, okay? This pink network, look at it down here and noticed in the pre-resting state, it's all in, there's a lot of it here in the temporal lobe and this is both cortical and subcortical. And there's also here in ventral PFC. And then there's a little bit further anterior um, medially. When we get here, look, it's much smaller. You'll notice that we still have all these pink nodes in the temporal lobe, but notice here the ventral PFC is now this purple color. And it's now part of this ventrofrontal subcortical network. That's what we've labeled it. And you'll see more about it um, in just a moment. Here I'm showing you the same data really. I'm gonna show you the same data really three times, three different ways. This is pre-resting state. This is post-resting state. You can see this is where the anterior DMATL is big. Now it's much smaller. Well, what's happened to it? What's happened to it, you can see here, part of it's broken off and joined up with this blue network. This blue network is a subcortical network. You can see it here. Um, this is striatum. Um, I'll show you the exactly what goes into it, but this is basically caudate um, and striatum. So this blue subcortical network joins up with a piece of what was the pink network and together they made these purple network, this purple network. So here I've been talking to you about the pink network and the purple network, okay? The pink is now um, temporal lobe. This purple is now the subcortical regions plus a piece of what was um, in the pink network before. And you'll see later why I keep talking about these. Here they are. This shows you what nodes are in each network. Again, it's really the same data, pre-resting, pre-task, pre post-task. This is the big, um, uh, pink uh, pre-task resting state. This is small. Small, it still has amygdala, temporal pole, hippocampus. This is all bilaterally, a little bit of PFC, okay? Here's what started out as that blue subcortical network. It's got thalamus, caudate, nucleus accumbens, putamen, all here. And notice that it's now, it's no longer here post-task resting state. All of those um, subcortical regions, they're here, nucleus accumbens, caudate, putamen, and they've joined up with that other, with that part of the ventral PFC that was originally here is now here. And so this, it's now ventral PFC with um, a lot of these subcortical um, regions, it's a reward network. It's very much a reward network. So what we now have in the pink is this limbic network, if you will, an amygdala hippocampus network uh, with temporal cortex. And we've got this purple reward network. Okay, do individual differences um, in uh, network response to frustration predict irritability? And the answer is yes. And here's our train test held out um, scatter plot. And I, what I wanna point out to you here is that we are using youth ratings. What we're trying to predict is the youth's rating of their own irritability in one model. And in the other model, the parent's rating of the child's irritability. Okay, so they're rating the same thing, but one is the youth rating, one is the, the parent rating. What predicts um, where global efficiency in what modules and in what condition of the task predict irritability in this held out sample? 
First of all, note what condition of the task. Only post-resting state. Again, we tested in all modules in all conditions. The only ones which came out was this recovery to frustration. And where, which modules, global efficiency in which modules, well, the child's rating of their irritability is predicted by the pink network, okay? Which I've explained to you. The parent rating of the child's irritability is the blue network, this purple network, this very much a reward-based network. Okay, so, oh, it's specific. Global efficiency in any module does not predict anxiety, inattention, or hyperactivity. And again, this is in the context of a frustration task. Okay, let me talk briefly about some data in the change task. Um, and um, let me just say it's a very different task. Um, that um, it's like the stop task, but you have to inhibit and shift. Uh, the um, difficult, the frustration comes from how difficult it is, and it's random. Frustration, non-frustration blocks are random, whereas in the affective Posner, it was all non-frustration followed by frustration. So very simple, similar sample. In fact, 35 of the 50 children here were also in the other data set, okay? Uh, reconfiguration, we found exactly the same thing, that the pink and the, the uh, frontoparietal net modules had the highest VIN. And here's the prediction. This is what you already saw with AP. Here's the change prediction. It's once again that frontotemporal limbic um, module, and it's the same, the same nodes, actually. But here it's predicting parent ARI, not child ARI. So we have an informant effect. Um, so informant effects are very important, very prominent in irritability research. Actually, they're pretty prominent in child psychiatry. Um, this is in a large sample of ours. Here you can see the correlation between the agreement between parent and child. It's respectable. Um, you know, that's about what you would see with anxiety. If you look at the more severely irritable kids, however, it's much lower. All right. And what you can see here is, um, so this is the difference between parent and child Ari. And you can see that um, this, this would be no difference um, at all. And you can see that there isn't a lot of um, gender effect um, and there really isn't much of an age effect either. Um, the test retest reliability is high. The parent agrees with themselves, um, you know, that is, is consistent, um, a very respectable ICC. Same with the child. You know, we tend sometimes to think of the child as not being a reliable reporter, but they're actually quite reliable on this. And so the discrepancy is also quite reliable, which means this isn't just noise. It means that the parent and the child are both giving us information, but it's somewhat different information. So one of the ways we're um, getting into this is with digital phenotyping. And I'm gonna go through this quickly to be sure that we have time for questions. Uh, one of the things we're looking at is whether uh, we can get more at this distinction between temper outbursts and chronically angry mood. We don't really know if that's a distinction that has external validity, whether it has important, like would, does phasic uh, irritability respond differently to treatment than tonic? Um, I will say that ADHD has stronger associations with phasic than with tonic irritability. And remember, um, when I showed you those data um, in the methylphenidate citalopram study, and I showed you that there was a response to methylphenidate, um, again, it's a small sample. The response was stronger with phasic irritability than it was with tonic irritability. So there may be be some difference in treatment. Um, we ask them to, here's the child and a parent in kids with a DMDD. We ask them, since the last beep, have you had a temper outburst? And that's what's in red here. This is a week, three ratings a day that people on the, the child and parent on their smartphone rating the child's irritability prompted to do it. And so there's 21 ratings. And notice there are informant effects here. When the child is saying they're having outbursts, it's not the same time 
as when the parent is, although they're not, it's a day later actually. And here's the grouchy mood. And you can see the parent sees the child as sort of more persistently grouchy, whereas the child sees themselves as uh, more variably grouchy. Um, okay, future work. Uh, we're going to replicate that study um, that I was showing to you, the uh, pre and post task resting state in a larger sample. We're going to add a control task. This is basically a Posner task without any reward because it could be that any task would show uh, this pink and green network uh, reorganizing the most, particularly the frontoparietal network. Uh, there's a lot of reasons why you might see that. Um, we are also gonna get DTI so we can constrain our study of structural connectivity with, um, I'm sorry, of, of functional connectivity with structural connectivity. We're gonna, um, we're gonna have the remote digital phenotyping um, and we are gonna uh, put all of this into a machine learning framework. The hypotheses follow exactly from what I told you. So for the informant effect, we're gonna have enhanced phenotyping, as I said, EMA, more clinician ratings and using a bifactor model. So um, in conclusion, um, there are associations among irritability and anxiety, and irritability, anxiety, and depression, but not bipolar disorder. There's a possible treatment effect of stimulants with or without SRI in children with severe irritability and ADHD. Um, aberrant responses to frustration are central to the pathophysiology of irritability. Frustration does induce a dynamic brain-wide response. Um, and we can predict irritability from um, the modules present in the post-frustration condition, recovery from frustration, particularly in this frontotemporal limbic circuit. There is an informant effect. And by the way, I should say this is true across two different paradigms, although there is an informant effect, and our future work will attempt replication and address limitations. This has the potential to identify mechanistic treatment targets. Obviously, you look at this and you think about um, working with children around how they feel after they're frustrated, about recovery from frustration. I wanna thank um, my collaborators and colleagues, Danny Pine, Melissa Broatman, and Lisa Collins. Lisa is our extremely talented uh, child and adolescent psychiatrist. And the folks um, in my section, I mentioned Katerina and Yulia. Elisa's done a lot of the work with ADHD and Wan Ling did that big N equals 200 study. She's now um, an assistant professor at Yale. And of course, our clinicians, our, re our research assistants, and most of all, the children and families. Thank you. Ellen, thank you. That uh, was amazing. Um, as we're waiting for um, questions um, from the group, um, really fascinating work on thinking about the flexibility in networks um, and this um, finding around um, how a task, particularly one that's related to um, frustration, may influence the switching. Um, I, Guess I'm curious about um, what what you're hoping to see. How will you look at kind of thinking about the duration of those oh. recovery effects, and what have you all begun to see clinically um, in how kids and parents describe those post frustration effects? So those are fabulous questions. So yes, I mean, um, it's unfortunate that we don't have um, more longer resting state data. Although I will say that in the new study, and we thought about, of course, doing more, but there's only so long we can keep, um, you know, these poor children in the scanner. Um, we are going to do an analysis where we can look at trends over the nine minutes to see you know where the effect is coming from it's a when when the effect is um, we have not been able now you know it's been the pandemic so we haven't had the clinical um, throughput 
that we are used to um, in terms of starting to debrief children and parents um, about the post frustration um, time. But uh, we really do look forward to doing that. And also talking more with Melissa and her team about the um, treatment. And actually they do exposure and then the treatment takes place. I mean, they, they talk with the child about their frustration, et cetera, afterwards, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, I was just thinking about that and our engagement with families on the inpatient unit um, and, and your point about parental accommodation was such an important one. So frequently, the accommodation is part of what we see and what sort of delays engagement and treatment because parents kind of walk on eggshells as long as they possibly can and then it gets to a point that they just can't tolerate it anymore. Um, and really thinking about how we might use gradual exposure as we do with distress tolerance, with DBT, exactly. as we do with um, you know fear responses and anxiety. That's um, what so Melissa's is modeled on. It really is. It's you know like I mean, there's a hierarchy. You yep. know, like what you would do for um, anxiety, basically, but it's frustration. So we have some questions coming in. Dr. Deutsch says, great talk. Couldn't tell from the charts, but did FTL or VFCS include aspects of the insula? Oh. How does frustrative non-reward imaging data differ from individuals with MDD? It's a great question, Dr. Deutsch. I, we definitely saw insula on the nodes. Uh, why well, can't, okay. My computer is saying, stop punching me so much. <laughs> oh, come on. Be nice. I'm trying, that's what I want. Okay, it's a good question. I once knew the answer to it, but I'm pretty sure, yeah, here's Insula. Okay. In this gray one, which I think we called CO. Yeah, singular opercular because um, that's in there, but let's look post resting state. Where is, here's the Insula. Um, so it's in with, yeah, we weren't quite sure why this is, it's within S, it's with S2 and some somatomotor. <laughs> um, yeah, now this is a shaft for parcellation and, you know, it's not perfect. None of the, um, none of the parcellations are perfect. So, you know, at some point, uh, we could go really look more closely at the anatomy. Um, of, of what Schaffer calls uh, the insula, you know, where it is. What was the second part of the question? The, the second part was about how does um, non -reward, frustrated non-reward imaging data differ for individuals with MDD, so with depressive disorders? Um, we don't know yet um, because, um, I mean, of course, what we would be comparing, well, there isn't, we don't have de depressed kids in our sample. There isn't a study of using a frustration paradigm in depressed kids. Actually, Manish Jha at um, UTSW is gonna be starting one in adults um, with, in conjunction with ketamine actually. Um, the, the prediction error piece of it, of course, you know, the MDD literature is a lot about the prediction error. So once um, Katerina finishes the carnival study, well, at least, no, we're not using the MID, which is what a lot of the MDD literature uses, but uh, we'll at least know something about, um, you know, uh, prediction error processing. So Dr. Cassio uh, says, thanks for the great talk. Um, she asked if you had the opportunity to look at sex or gender effects in the samples that you studied. Okay, we did in one lings. Um, we do, we look at it in all our samples and we haven't seen any actually. Interesting. Um, yeah, um, so there's no evidence now, you know, literature's small, but there isn't any evidence of gender effects on the brain imaging. Um, I think the most interesting article about um, sex and gender is one by Lucy Riglin is the first author, R-I-G-L-I-N, and Anita Thapper is the last author, and it's in the American Journal of Psychiatry. Maybe it's 
2019, 2020. Um, Danny and Argiris and I are also co-authors on it. What they argue they are using genetic data is that there's two subtypes of irritability. There's the early onset male predominant comorbid with ADHD and the later adolescent onset female predominant comorbid with major depression. And I think it's a very interesting, I think we need more data um, from a number of different, but that's the kind of, I think, most, it's too early to call it compelling, but most provocative finding about gender differences and irritability in the literature. Uh, John Ebert asks, what parent caregiver interventions do you see as effective to co-regulate in irritability? So Melissa's um, uh, uh, exposure therapy is paired with parent management training. Okay, so parent management training as kind of the core of... Yeah, I mean, there's certainly a lot of evidence for parent management training in preschoolers, and there's some in um, conduct disorder, irritability, mostly in the context of conduct disorder in adolescence, a lot of that done sort of in groups. But, you know, there's a there's a reasonable, certainly in certain subgroups, there's a lot of um, efficacy data for parent management training. Okay. Um, you know, one of the things that we think about, um, Dr. Ebert and I work together in consultation to the foster care system, and um, one of the important things for um, how we engage with parents working with um, traumatized children is thinking about how are the caregivers regulating their own emotional response to what's going on? And I don't know if that's a part of the parent management training. Do they focus on you know, the parental response or is it more just behavioral? It's more just behavioral, but Melissa is thinking a lot more about getting exactly into that. Cool. Uh, Stephanie Peoples writes, this was an amazing and unique presentation. What standardized tools does your team use for bipolar diagnosis in children? And what are the effective tools that are available? So, I mean, we do a case ads um, for bipolar disorder. I will say that the latest version of the case ads is not good at all for DMDD. Mm. It's really not good. Um, I've, I've spoken with Joan Kaufman about this. Um, the uh, skip out, uh, you know, the screening questions, um, are really insufficient. Um, so we use a more, a different module and I would be totally happy to share with anybody who wants it, that module. For the bipolar piece, we just use the case heads. Uh-huh, so the case heads is a semi-structured clinician delivered interview that starts with screening questions and then um, kind of refers you to modules similar to the SCID for adults. Exactly, thank you, Meg. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, and it looks like um, Dr. Heckers has a question. Jenny, are we able to um, activate Dr. Heckers' mic? Yes, I just uh, went to promote him to panelist here. Stefan, have you been promoted? Oh, he declined. Oh, no, here he comes. It looks like you're on mute. There you are. I don't know whether I have been, but uh, I didn't have a question. I just wanted to say hi, that's all. Hi, Stefan, it's great to see you. Thank you for coming, Ellen. Yeah, we were saying, I, we really wish it was in person. Uh, ho hopefully next time it will be in person. Absolutely, we'd look forward this is to it. An absolutely wonderful talk, Ellen. Thank you so much, um, really um, great. And thanks to everyone for being here. Thank you again to Volney and to Barbara for making this um, endowed lecture possible and um, happy weekend to everyone. And thank you all, it's been a pleasure. And thank you, Meg, for moderating. My pleasure.